plug and stop. So, we are just having a look at some of the things that people say about home birth and first baby. And I've invited people to enter in on to create this word cloud of things for reasons for not to have your first baby at home. And I think that's often the, the reaction you get. People go, you're having a home birth, first baby. Sometimes people say, will they allow you to do that? Are you allowed to have a home birth with your first baby? Perhaps somebody could enter that. Are you allowed? Um, and this is what we get. There's a lot about it being, you know, you hear about it not being safe um, or too risky. Maybe you're for your second, but not for your first. Yes, no docs available. Um, somebody once told me um, when they found out I was having a home birth, they said, um, <laughs> they said, you do know you can't have a cesarean at a home birth. They don't, I don't think they do cesareans at a home birth. <laughs> and go, um, no. <laughs> need a cesarean we'll go to hospital um i think people yes they're like you know sometimes are really bizarre what people think uh, if anybody's ever seen them um, the film um business of being born and they there's a doctor there an obstetrician who says um what do they have to do at the home birth i don't even know if they need to get the baby out do they do they do a cesarean there I don't know. No. Right, brilliant. This is what sort of things I was expecting. We've got no doctors available, misconceptions, not safe mess, yeah, too dangerous. And what if there are complications? So I'm just going to go back to my slides. And a quick note about language. Um, Instead of talking about whether you're allowed or not allowed, I'm going to use words around you'll be offered, you can choose. Um, I'm not a big fan of using the word risk because I think it's a very emotionally um, charged, particularly around birth, because people don't want to take a risk with their baby. Um, and some people don't like chance either for similar reasons. I think personally, I find chance is less emotionally laden you know than doing something that's risky people don't want to be seen as risk takers um so i tend to use chance or likelihood um and instead of using high risk I use higher risk or additional factors because actually these things are often not high risk um if i said to you that there, tomorrow there's high risk of snow tomorrow you would probably expect it to be 40 50 percent or more chance of having snow if i told you that it was like less than half a percent chance of snow you would tell me that's not a high risk of snow it's higher maybe in scotland it's a 0.5 half a percent chance of snow um whereas down in um brighton uh it's less than that it's 0.1 percent um so Scotland would have a higher chance, at be it higher risk of snow, but it's still a really low risk. Do you see what I mean? Um, well, so you can read these. So this is what I try and use because I think language matters. Um, so we've talked about common responses. Yeah. Home birth is dangerous for first babies, linked to poorer health outcomes, for ba particularly for babies. NHS don't even recommend it. You don't know how you're going to labour. You could be problems. So it's better to be in hospital in case you need it. Uh, birth is painful. It's your first baby. You don't know how you're going to cope with the pain. And there's no pain relief at home. Um, yes, why be a martyr? Somebody told me when I was pregnant with my third. I already had a home birth. I didn't have my first baby at home. I wanted to, but I was I was told no by my midwife, by my doctor. Um, and I didn't know what I know now. She's 27. So <laughs> um, 
I wish I put the foot down a bit more, but everybody, um, yeah, everybody around me was like, no. Um, but I had the others at home. It was lovely. Um, yes, so I was told, don't be a martyr. Um, so people often think birth is painful and you don't know how you're going to cope with the pain. Um, and if you did plan to home birth, have a home birth, there's a high foot transfer rate for first babies. So you're going to end up in hospital anyway. So why, why not start there? And these are the things we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the research on the safety for first babies. We're going to look at the pain and discomfort. We're going to look at pain, discomfort, if you want to call it that, instead, and home birth, and what statistics and some of the options. We're going to look at how home birth influences those outcomes. You know, how your labour goes can be influenced by where you're giving birth. And we'll look at the transfer rates and reasons for transfer. And hopefully we have time to finish with a short visualisation so that you can, because it will can feel stressful and we want to bring down those um, stress hormones. What I'm not going to do today is talk about general stuff about home birth, what you need to get ready or um, more in detail about um, why home birth is so great. Um, so that's have to come back for something else <laughs> because just well I want you to make it quick and light so home birth is safe home birth is a safe birth um the idea that home birth isn't safe um came particularly of a number of reasons um but the around in 1970 the then minister of health um, uh, Lord Peel uh, did a big survey on health and outcomes and he found that um, perinatal outcomes, so um, perinatal mortality, so babies dying around the time of birth, um, the rates had gone down with about the same rate that hospitals um, hospital birth had increased. Hospital birth increased for a number of different reasons, um, not least because um, the rationing went on for quite a long time after the war and um, the NHS was set up. You could go and give birth um, in hospital. You stayed there for 10 days and you didn't use your rations up. Um, so that was it. And obviously it was seen as new and modern and all those things. So Peel did this report and they found this out, this link, and they said, oh, it's because home birth then is more dangerous. And he may told hospitals to make or health trusts to make provision for 100 percent of births to take place in hospital. And they, it stuck. But in 1980, Marjorie True, she was a, a statistics lecturer and she did. Um, trained uh, medical you know, medical undergraduates she was giving them she set medical undergraduates uh, a task of using the statistics to prove that hospital birth was the safest place and she was really confused when every single one of them came back um, finding the opposite finding that the home birth was at least at safe and actually had better and better outcomes and she found that um so she went and dug into all the research and produced a book, Home but um, Safe for Childbirth, it's called. And she found that, first of all, sometimes the birth outcomes for planned and unplanned home births were lumped together. And unplanned home births tended to have poor outcomes for a variety of reasons. Um, but if you only looked at the planned home births, then home birth was at least as safe. And she found home birth was at least as safe for low risk, medium risk, and slightly high risk compared to hospital birth. It was only those that are very high risk that would definitely do better in hospital. Um, and she looked then, so where did this idea come from? And what she found was that at the same time as hospital, um, hospital births increased, so um, so did standards of living and poverty declined. Um, housing was better. We had NH free health care. And she, she then confirmed that by looking at outcomes for those who were living in poverty. 
and she found that whilst outcomes for perinatal outcomes had improved for every everybody else they had not improved for those living in poverty um, and we know that poverty is the biggest um, factor impacting on um, health outcomes and health outcomes around birth particularly so that's where it came from but let's just talk about first timers so there was a big study done so the NHS but the NHS doesn't doesn't support home birth for first babies well it doesn't not support them you can absolutely your NHS and the um, midwives will absolutely support you if you want to have your face baby at home that's not a problem I don't mean it like that but I'm saying like in the literature and in the advice given the um, NHS website and all the literature you get it says that giving birth is generally safe wherever you have your baby but if you're having your first baby, it says home birth slightly increases the risk of serious problems for the baby, including death or issues that might affect the baby's quality of life. Um, from five in a thousand for a hospital birth to nine in a thousand for a home birth. Um, and those of you who are around, I looked, I don't think this document, Birthplace Decisions, is necessarily being used anymore. Um, but this came out off um, because this is based on the birthplace study the UK birthplace study um, that it was done in 2010, because my son was one of them, uh, my youngest, and it came out the following year. And this was one of their findings. And we're going to look at this because this is where it all comes from. Um, and this, the picture on the right um, came from the, the document birthplace decisions, which came from the birthplace study. Um, and they're trying to represent it um, pictorially. I just want to point out that you'll see that it's five babies per th thousand for planned birth, per birth planned in the obstetric unit. It's also five per 1,000 for an alongside midwifery unit. By that, we mean a midwifery unit that's on the same site as the hospital, often the same corridor, <laughs> you know, um, but. So that is an alongside, so it's very quick. You don't transfer. Um, you just you really, you, you just go down the corridor or even just open a couple of doors and you're in the obstetric unit. A freestanding midwifery led unit um, is a unit that is away from the hospital. So if you wanted to get to the obstetric unit, you would, tra you would need to travel by ambulance or for, for transfers, um, usually by ambulance so they are all the same so they do compare so they said compared to from five in a thousand for a hospital birth it could also be a midwife led unit birth compared to nine thousand and you can see i've highlighted that at the bottom there um they do actually say compared to first birth in an obstetric unit but so Oh, I'm going to come back to this. There were no more babies in the birthplace study. There were no more. Statistically, there wasn't a difference between the number of babies that died who would had. We're talking about planned home birth. Now, these this is all low risk women. I'm going to look at higher risk later. The category of low risk women. Um, Statistically, there was no difference between the numbers of babies that died in which, wherever people had planned to give birth, irrespective of where they ended up. Um, but there were slightly more in the home birth than they were perhaps expecting. So I'm going to go back to my dice. And this is important. So statistical significance. So if you had, you're trying to work out whether a dice is loaded. And you've got a six sided dice and you throw it a um, hundred, 200 times. And if you get an even spread of the numbers from one to six, you know that the dice isn't loaded. But if there's a really high rate of throwing a number six, say, you know that the dice is loaded to give you a six. 
if you only threw that dice a dozen times, and out of those 12 times, four of them were a six, you might think that dice is loaded, but that could be, that could just be chance. That's why the bigger numbers, if you did it 100, 200 times, you would then know that it wasn't, um, whether it really was loaded or not, have a better chance, have a better chance of statistical probability. And there are, um, there are uh, mathematical tools um, that, and I, I did I did a psychology degree, so we did statistics as a part of it. I did, I've got statistics GCSEs, but it wasn't O level. Um, and there are statistical analysis that you do to verify whether you have um, statistical significance. Now, with now the birthplace study didn't find a statistical significance, so it could be the the slightly more than they were expecting, and um, perinatal deaths could be just by chance. Um, because um, babies dying is uh, fortunately such a rare thing, still, still too many, but um, there wasn't enough women, although there were, I think it was 67,000 births in this, in this study, it wasn't quite big enough for such a rare event to be able to see um, enough to be statistically significant to know whether it was chance or not. It's a bit like having a 20-sided dice. If you only throw that 100, 200 times, you're not gonna be able to, you, you're gonna to have to throw that a thousand times or more to be able to get statistical significance. So the birthplace study didn't have that. So they looked at, and this was only for first timers, for second timers, there wasn't the difference. Um, for first time, so what they did, they created an amalgamated poor outcome. And they put in there um, the stillbirth after start of labor, early neonatal, all these things, um, neonatal encephalopathy, um, and I've forgotten this completely, but it's something to do with the brain, meconium aspiration syndrome. Um, and that's where the babies have breathed in some of the meconium, the babies first poo into their lung, lungs. Now, 10% of babies where there is meconium in the waters, 10% of those um, develop meconium aspiration syndrome, roughly. Only 10% of them does it become a real problem. So that brachioplexus plexus injury and fractured humerus and clavicle, these are all um, bones around here and that's to do with you know, as birth injuries as the baby comes out. So not all of these are life-threatening or even long-term. They didn't include, oh, that's good. It's my son's bedtime alarm going off. I'm gonna just disappear and turn it off. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, they didn't include a number of other really important factors um, that are affected and um, and did um, take a drink of water, take a deep breath. Now, one of the interesting things here. Oh, yes. They didn't choose to use APCA scores. So APCA it was named after Dr. APCA, a female obstetrician who devised a very rough and ready um, way to assess a baby's condition at birth, an APCA score um, assessing the baby's skin tone, breathing, um, uh, alertness and that sort of thing. And um, they do it at one minute, five minutes and 10 minutes. And um, APCA score at five minutes is often used as a way to know how 
babies how well babies are but it is very rough and ready and they decided not to use it but it's a bit frustrating because it tends to be used in every everything else they did look at it oh and I've got I've got it somewhere I'll look it up um I'll put it in the email I'm gonna do an email um I wanted to point out this this is a slight anomaly because you'll see that a midwife led unit standalone midwife led unit had a similar to an alongside midwife led unit and obstetric led unit labor ward is essentially an obstetric led unit is an obstetric led unit um now a standalone midwife led unit has no no more specialist equipment the midwives carry to a home birth it is um you still have to transfer in in fact the birth place study um, the tramp they looked at difference in transfers and there was on average longer um, from midwife led unit in that study and um, than from a home birth so why was there this even if you take their amalgamated poor outcome um even if you just look at that there sh really should be no difference between home birth and a standalone midwife led unit now I asked one of the researchers on Twitter, um, I asked her why there was this difference between a standalone midwife led unit and a home birth. Um, and she said she didn't know. They couldn't work that one out. The only thing that she could say to me was that one of their other findings, they looked at um, transfer rates and midwives confidence and they found that areas where midwives were more confident at doing home births had had lower transfers um now midwives who work at standalone midwife led units tend to be um very happy being autonomous very um yeah they love doing low risk um low risk births <laughs> um, and we midwives on community who tend to be the ones doing home births because not all places have a home birth um a home birth team they can be a real mixed bag in my experience so a lot of them love doing home birth a lots of them absolutely love it um but some of them like it because they like doing the antenatal and the postnatal they like the relationship but they don't like doing home births um I had somebody turn up to my home birth and she was like I really don't like doing water births I really don't like doing water births and, and she just sat on the sofa passing time until the next till the midwife came and it was just oh she just could tell she didn't want to be there such a shame because so many I I love home births, midwives midwives community midwives love home births um that's you're so brilliant <laughs> those of you who are those um so yeah anomaly there's no reason so let's have a look now do you remember i said that wasn't able to be statistically significant because it wasn't big enough well since then there have been a couple more studies that were much bigger so i said that is around 64,000, 67,000 in the in the birthplace was it 64 birthplace youth study here we've got ones that are much bigger. I couldn't, I couldn't, I meant to look up the um, Netherlands study, um, but again, that was very big. Um, and they found there was, for first time, is there was no difference in perinatal or neonatal mortality. Um, that was in Hutton et al, that's quite recent. The Netherlands study, the rates of admissions to NICU and low APGOR scores did not differ significantly different among nully Paris means first timers um the going back to um, admissions to neonatal unit um the birthplace study found that um for first timers there was no difference in the number of babies going to a neonatal unit so I I think we can conclude that although the birthplace study found this Poor difference in poor outcome that um, it doesn't mean that your necessarily your baby is more at risk because one this poor outcome is an amalgamated and includes things that aren't long-term or life-threatening um that some of the other things that are life um 
that are about that are long term, like breastfeeding and skin to skin, are better for, with home birth, but they weren't included in the study. And also we have to look at the fact that there is this anomaly between standalone midwife led units and home birth. And it's really odd that we saw that and we don't know why. But we do know that there have been bigger, much bigger studies that have been able to look at statistical difference in terms of perinatal mortality. And they found that there isn't a difference. But the midwives and the birthing teachers here today will tell you, for some reason, if a study shows that more intervention improves outcomes, no matter how weak the evidence is, it seems to get adopted. If you get something that shows actually less intervention makes an outcome, it takes years and years and years before it gets adopt adopted. Take um, cutting the umbilical cord um, or skin to skin in, on the, in a cesarean. Yeah, so. If you've got any questions on this, do pop them into the chat. Um, oh, high risk. So they didn't talk. There are a number of studies around higher risk, higher risk women um, and birthing people, but they um, they don't always separate out um by first timers and um others i'm just gonna hit escape because i can't see i can't get to my um i can't get to my you are all seeing all my slides and everything i hope because I'm worrying now that you're not seeing my slides because I can't see. I am on Zoom, so you are seeing my slides. I'm not sh not showing me any of the. Like, oh, there, chat, thank you. We're seeing them. Oh, thank you, Laura. I've not been seeing and nobody's nobody's asked to join. So I just wanted to check that nobody has come to join like we'll carry on presenting they um among so yes um you can read these and i'll send you links for the research afterwards um so at all ages low risk women who plan birth for the um, non new sentient younger nulliparous women so um, appear to benefit more from the reduction so it does make a difference <laughs> um, and so here's one that's saying that um, lower intervention well we're, so we're going to have a look at the intervention rates later next I just thought I'd put a note, particularly for those of you who are parents and wondering, OK, so how, but how about safety? So I've just put in here about um, how midwives um, support safety at a home birth. I think there's this myth that midwives can't do anything and don't carry anything. So I've got here the monitoring that they do. And this is how one of the things they do. One of the best th reasons for having a home birth is you have a midwife with you um, who is only watching you. She's not what, caring for another woman. She's not being called to check something else or um, she hasn't got to be anything else that she needs to do, just you. And she is, she's, they keep so many records. I mean, as a doula, I, you know, it almost breaks my heart, the number of how many, how much records they keep and the, how much they, they are really watching and monitoring and ready to intervene. Um, they get, they've got backup. One of the things you have to look at when you're considering where the research comes from is, is it an equitable 
system. So, for example, um, you can't really look at home birth in the United States um, because, um, I mean, in just under half the states, it's illegal to be a midwife in the states. And um, it can be really difficult for, um, so it's only independent midwives and they can have problems when they transfer in. So it's not an integrated system. Here, midwives will be on the phone and checking with their colleagues and updating on what's happening, asking for advice. You have two midwives with you, unless you give birth really fast. Um, so there's one came for you, one came for the baby. And they will call them again. We've got integrated free health service. They will call an ambulance just in case and have them on standby. I had I was a doula with somebody giving birth, a second baby. She was approaching 42 weeks. There was a bit of old meconium in the waters when her waters went, and which is quite common once you get past 41 weeks. But they phoned in and they checked and they got the ambulance. They said, you're going to have this baby before the ambulance even gets here. So it's not really a problem. Um, but the ambulance came and um, they waited on the stairs. Um, the baby had been born. The baby was fine. Um, they just waited for uh, 10, 15 minutes and then they went away again. And so, you, you know, there is such this safe network that, that people don't realise. Um, they also carry lots of equipment. I think people don't realise how much equipment um, they have and these big bags that they bring in. Um, all sorts of things to monitor, to check. They do have, they have stuff. Um, they, they have uh, medicine in drugs in case you hemorrhage. Midwives are trained to do what to do in, hem in case there's hemorrhage and they get it out. And one of the ways I know that the baby, when I'm a doula, I know the baby's almost here because the midwife is, they lay out an emergency area. So a little resuscitation area and they get out everything they should need just in case the baby needs help. And they do that before the baby's born, so it's there ready. So as a doula, I'm like, all oh, the midwives getting everything out. It must mean that the birth's imminent. Um, and they get out the, the vials that they need and they lay it all out. And so they are ready to go. And um, so they have drugs there for hemorrhage and they know what to do. They, they train what to do if it's a, um, for all sorts of different scenarios and do ask if you want any and I'll send some suggestions of reading and things but the probably the three most important things that the midwife carries with her one is her telephone so that she can call and get back up call an ambulance get and talk to supervisors the next thing is her eyes because she's watching you and this is on things that happens with a home birth is there's this wonderful teamwork that goes on. And the midwife is able to notice, because she's with you all the time, she's able to see the pattern of your labor. And she's able to see if your labor's stalling. And she's able to see the, the and she's able to listen to the noises that you're making and assessing. And she, you know, it's a really, really skilled job assessing how you're doing and whether you might need help. And they even use their nose. Um, sometimes I can smell it too, and you know the birth is really close. Um, and they do all these things, and they don't take chances. So they will make suggestions that maybe you might need some help, and they will plan for you to get that help and be in the place where you need to be um, before you need it but they were also trained to do with emergencies, as we said. Oh, that's twice. Um, so what about, we're moving on to the pain one. Oh, but it's, you know, first baby, you don't know how painful birth's going to be and you might be able to cope and how can you tell all this thing? Well, do you know planning a home birth makes it less painful? <laughs> Seriously, I know it's like, um, yes, Anna says we have all the same equipment, wood in a standalone unit, they are safe. Absolutely. Um, 
So women who plan home births have less pharmacological pain relief. Um, in the birthplace study, only 3% of first timers transferred to get an epidural. That were the ones that were actually having a home birth. So some of the people who planned a home birth in the birthplace study didn't end up starting off at, in, at home. So it could be that they planned a home birth, but actually they were induced or whatever. Um, but those who planned a home birth and labored at home, only 3% of them transferred for an epidural. Um, and you can see, if you look at all the people who had a planned home birth, um, so not just first timers, only 8% had an epidural compared to 31% who planned to give birth in obstetric led unit, all low risk people. Um, so it really does, why? So why, why? So, you know, if you're worried about coping with labor, then having a home birth is a really good idea. It's, it's like, it's opposite what everybody else thinks. And there are a number of reasons for this. So there's a pain, fear, stress, tense cycle. So you fear the pain, you release stress hormones, you tense your muscles, you feel pain. So then you fear the pain more, you get more stressed and more tense, and it's more painful. And so actually the more relaxed you can be, honestly, the less, the less pain, pain you'll experience. So if you can relax, you feel less pain, and then you're confident for the next one. So you go, oh, that work. I cope with that one. So I can relax, I can relax a bit more the next one. I don't have to be tense. And that's, um, and I had, when I had my last baby, um, I, for various reasons, lucky enough, or made choices or whatever I oh, didn't use um have not even gas and air I plan to use gas and air and I was like I have to do things to help me hold off with my first so once you've done it once without any pharmacological pain relief then that gives you more confidence so but I did use all these other things that you can use I did there's all these these are all the things that you can have and I was very aware that it i the pain was there, but I was relaxing and I was breathing. I was in a pool. I was feeling supported and confident. I was getting hugs and my back was being rubbed and there was low lighting and soft talking. And all these things just brought the pain down. So I felt nothing. I felt while I was doing that, I was feeling no pain. If I let stop doing any of those things, it would come back. Now I'm not saying it was, I'm not saying it wasn't completely painful. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, this is the same for everybody in different pain, there's all sorts of things, but it definitely makes a difference. And it's much easier to relax at home, to move, to dance. You know, there are more things to lean on at home. You've got your own shower, your own toilet. You can eat the food and drink that you want. All these things just make it more comfortable and easier to cope with. You can walk around the house, up and down the stairs, go out in the garden. In my last one, the midwife, I, all my others are given birth at night. This one was during the day. I was born just after midday in April. It was a glorious sunny day. I spent hours in the garden and the midwife's going, she could tell, I think she could tell it was getting close. She's like, are you going to come inside or are you giving birth in the garden? Um, so that's one thing at home it does help let's have a look so there we we've looked at is home birth dangerous for babies we've looked at how you cope um now what about if you might need the help because you don't know how the birth's going to go well, one of the things is planning a home birth, you are more likely to have a straightforward birth. You are less likely to need all that intervention. So there is something in, they call iatrogenic harm. I can't quite say it properly, um, but it means that the treatment you're getting is causing other harms. Um, oh, that's a picture of me after I had my third. Um, on my bedroom floor, I was leaning, I was leaning over the bed. Um,
I love this quote. Um, I've held on to this quote for a long time, you can see. <laughs> so the vast majority will not have com needing complications and actually do worse at hospital. So let's have a look. So your chance with a, as a first timer of having no intervention is 67% if you plan a home birth compared to 46%, 46 out of 100, if you plan to give birth in the obstetric led unit. Your chance of ending up with an emergency cesarean is, you can see it's almost halved just by planning a home birth. And these are all, all low risk women. There's slightly more, the ones that were giving birth in plan, planning to give birth in the obstetric led unit who were home but um, low risk did tend to have slightly more sort of underlying conditions um but um if you you know they still came under the low risk um and some of the underlying conditions didn't necessarily affect um giving birth but just to clarify that but generally um so assisted birth means forceps or vontus where the baby is either has the the tongs or the suction cap to help them out um we can have a look at this is these are the only ones that the outcomes that are separated by first and second timers um and we can have a look certainly definitely if you're having a second baby <laughs> you want to give it birth at home um or outside the obstetric led unit um so moving on to the next slide if we look at some of the other outcomes um you can see so this is first and subsequent babies all together this is not um this is not differentiated out um you can see that overall no intervention rates 88 percent compared to 58 in the obstetric led unit even a standalone or a midwife led unit um you can see i mean standalones are pretty good um and they're, they're better than obstetric led unit, even the alongside. There's sort of the going in as low, less, you know, as low as you can, really. Um, you are much, you have greater chance of having water for pain relief in a standalone unit. Um, but you can see, so let's go through no intervention, emergency cesarean, assisted birth, that said that's the suction or the tongs, um, third or fourth degree tear. So that's your um in your perineum where um there is a, a tear to the tissue between the um around the vagina, and the third degree tear goes to the anus and the fourth degree tear goes into the muscle of the anus um right way through yes the third degree goes just to the edge of the muscle um episiotomy is where you have a cut um now you have a 19 percent chance now this was done in 2010 this study took place so lots of things have changed um and be really interesting around that. But if you know one in five in the obstetric leg unit back in 2010 compared to one in 20 at home, um, for getting having your bits cut, um, water for pain relief. As I said, epidural, we looked at that earlier, artificial oxytocin. So having your labor speeded up. So you've already gone into labor, but you're having the hormone drip to speed your labors up you're much more likely again these are all very similar women all low risk and physiological third stage so that's having not having the injection to get the placenta out you're much more likely to have that out of the obstetric fed unit and more most likely to um, have that and initial breastfeeding varies as well they didn't um I found that interesting because it's like it's really when you look at this, it's like really compelling is <laughs> the argument for home birth. Let's have a look about higher risk women. So they did look the, again, there's not broken down for first or second timers. But again, it's a very similar pattern um, and not hugely different from um, from. And this would include um, this did include 
um, than women who've had IVF. I don't, I'm not aware of studies that have compared um, difference in outcomes um, of place and birth for, for IVF, pay, um, for people who've um, conceived by IVF. So here we are, the benefits of home birth. Um, I'll take a drink of water while you have a read. Check my, how are we doing for time? Oh, we have overrun, but we were a bit late starting. Sorry about that. Let's move on then. This is what one of the dads um, who I was a doula for, one of the men whose partners, um, well, um, them, he's my client as well, not just his um, partner not just the pregnant person, I'm there for both of them. Um, and he said, it's like with a car mechanic. <laughs> he said, if your car's in a garage up on the ramps and they say, you, oh, it needs this, that, the other, then you really feel obliged to say yes. You don't, you're less obliged to say, no, we'll leave it or, you know, get a second opinion. But if the, mo the car mechanic comes to your drive and does, is that you, you feel much more confident, have more confidence in, um, in what, what you're doing and asking for things it's also to do given why the outcomes are so good it's because this is the bit where we give birth and we it's also about the hormones mm -hmm. oh it's because i'm clicking on clicking on the wrong way you're going to yes um like cats you know we like well you know we get it flows better when we are feeling safe and loved and our brain needs to feel that we're safe and it birth works better with that and the environment matters so you know going to the toilet these are the things that help you to go to the toilet and your body can let go um, having a romantic night, these are the things that allow your hormones to flow, whereas a hospital birth tends to be the things that stop the hormones and your body can't let go. Whereas a home birth, you get all those things, so that means your body can let go and your hormones can flow. Now, here we are. So that's so. Um, you don't know if you'll need help. Actually, you're less likely to need help if you plan a home birth. But what if you do need help? So these are the most common reasons for transferring from home birth to hospital birth. So you are more likely, on average, to transfer to hospital. 44% out of 100 of first timers, 44 out of 100 first timers did transfer to hospital. Um, now, the how many, it's not how many out of the 44, it's how many out of all of them. So out of the 44, a quarter of them transferred for a slow first stage. Um, the next most common reason is a slow second stage. So we know that first time births can take a long time. So it wasn't an emergency. If you add those two together, it's not quite half of the transfers, but it's almost. We could add on so meconium being in the water so <clears throat> if you're having your second baby you you know with your first baby labor just takes longer you you know you're talking 12 hours or more and generally um and the pushing bit is common for it to be two three hours with a second baby, the pushing bit is more like quarter an hour, half an hour. So, and your waters are more likely to go when you're pushing. So if you imagine that your waters go um, as you're pushing and there's meconium in the waters, it's your second baby. You're, like it happened with the woman I was at doula for, you, you haven't got a chance to get to hospital because you'll have had the baby by the time the baby's born. Second baby there's more time to transfer. So generally it's in the guidelines that to transfer you in 
um, if there is meconium in the waters in case it gets into the lungs, as we talked about, small chance. And a small chance, if it does get into the lungs, it's a big problem. Um, but as I said, take, don't take chances. Midwives don't take chances. So you are more likely to transfer the meconium with your first baby, partly because that bit, there is more time to transfer you. That's what I'm trying to say, really. We've talked about the epidural and um, PPH is postpartum hemorrhage. Um, we've already looked at you're much less likely to end up with a postpartum hemorrhage. That was in the previous one. Um, I think that then um, with, a, with a home birth and you can see it's a small chance. So you've got a 98.8% chance of not having a hemorrhage. Um, with the home birth midwives, as I said, are trained to deal with it. Um, people also transfer for perineal repair. Um, and there are lots of, there are some other that are really ra rarer. So they're not, I haven't included in here. People think that the reason for transferring in is because the baby's in distress, there's a problem with the baby. And it's actually, there's all these other things. So I have put fetal, fetal distress. So the baby is showing signs that they're not coping. Um, you can see that it's only 2%, two out of 100 of all those women who had, had planned home births, only two, two out of the 100 transferred in because um, there was uh, concerns about the baby's well-being. It was, oh, I can't do the math, a small percentage of those who transferred in um, transferred in because there was fetal distress. And there is more time to transfer if there's fetal distress in second stage. There's more time to transfer in potentially depending on how when it is. Um, but it's so it's not, you can see there's a whole range. And there are a range of other things that happen. You know, the baby's the baby's cold, they're you know, not warming up, or the baby's very small. There's all sorts of reasons why transfers happen. Um, and you'll see that most of these reasons for transferring in aren't they're not it's not life and death um i hope that helps sometimes i find that i found that when you talk about the reasons for transferring in it's people go oh you think of transferring in being like because it's so dangerous but as i said before midwives so don't take chances um but also that you know home birth happens differently at home um it unfolds differently um, I like to frame it like this, that all births that start spontaneously, so all births, not planned cesareans, not inductions, all births that start spontaneously are home births. It's just that some have planned their transfer. And if by planning a home birth, you're simply not planning a transfer. If a transfer is needed, you'll transfer. But if you don't need it, you'll stay at home. If you go... So we have a look here, 44 out of 100 first timers transferred in, in labor or after labor. Some of them are for you know, postnatally, um, after, not postnatally, after the birth, um, 44 out of the 100. Those who planned a hospital birth, 100 out of 100 transferred in, in labor. One of the advantages of having a home birth is that the midwife comes to you and you don't have to make a journey in the car. Um, I once heard a talk at a home birth conference by a dad of um, who'd, who who um, his twins had been born at home, and he happened to work in statistics and in um, risks. Um, he did road traffic statistics, accident statistics. That was his job, and he worked out. So he looked at all the statistics, and he worked out that there was more chance of. The, his twins dying on the way to hospital in their car than there was for them having um, been born at home. Uh, I shared this quote, some of you might have seen this. Um, this is a great, you know, actually your first one is the best one to have at home because it sets how, you know, if you have some people don't even go on to have second babies because they have birth trauma from their first ba baby. Um, how, what happens in your first birth 
has an impact on subsequent births. You go to hospital, high chance of having, if you have a planned hospital birth, your first baby, a high chance of having a cesarean. And then you've, then you will have a giving birth the next time you're giving birth. You're trying to decide between, you know, you've now got a scar on your uterus. You can still have a home birth. Um, I support lots of women who've had previous cesareans and have home births, but there are additional things going on. You can have additional things. You need like the third or fourth degree tear, and that can cause um, issues going on. And you can still have a home birth. I had supported um, a client, a doula client, to have a home birth after a fourth degree tear. And um, we, um, her and I, and um, Diane Garland, who um, we sought advice from, who's a world renowned midwife to do with water birth. We wrote an article in the Practicing Midwife magazine about water birth after a fourth degree tear. So these things are possible, but it makes it all more tricky. So if you can get it, so having the most straightforward birth the first time around, it's a lot easier for subsequent births. So, um, and the best way you can do that is with home birth. And we all know that home births aren't necessarily aren't for everybody. And they're not necessarily, you can best lay plans. Um, you might need that transfer or you might not actually get to even start at home. Um, but you're, what you're doing by planning the home birth is putting yourself in the best position that you can for all to go well. And what I've found and as a, as a doula supporting clients who transferred it in, and also with people who um, have come to my home birth group, that um, the support they've received when they've transferred in, that they've had, um, that they, the midwives have gone out of their way to give them as close to a home birth as they can in hospital. <laughs> so um, it's sometimes people think that it's the, work, the opposite. Oh, you were planning a home birth. We're now going to give you, you know, the worst treatment. And it's the opposite way around. It's like, we really feel for you and we're going to try and um, or somebody waiting. Yeah, come in. So this is what we've looked at. Hopefully you are feeling less anxious and more happy and relaxed to deal with these issues. Um, and I'm going to turn off the recording in a minute and ask you. Um, this is the president of the International Confederation of Midwives. Um, and she said this on Twitter. And um, she said that women don't opt for outside guidance care. We opt for guidelines that don't include the needs of all women. So you wanting a home birth of your first baby, just because it's not in the guidelines, it doesn't mean that you're awkward. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that the guidelines are awkward and that the guidelines are not. And the, inter the president of the International Confederation of Midwives is telling you that. So you can take comfort from her understanding that the guidelines are not always helpful um, and that it's fine to be told that you're giving birth outside of guidelines or against medical advice. Um, we know that personalised care is the most important thing. Oh yes, just before we go to questions, I do have some home birth and water birth facilitator training. Um, and we look at all these things, all the things around home birth, all the things about water birth. And I train you to deliver a workshop for parents online or in person. You get only get all the resources to do that. I'll send you details in the email. OK, I'm going to turn this off. Stop the share. Um, so how are you all feeling now? Do you have any, I'm going to turn the recording, I haven't turned the recording off yet. Let me turn the recording off. <laughs> 